So, wowie, this is so exciting. It's already Hanukkah here in the holiest of holy lands. Oh, look, people are appearing. Okay, we're gonna give 30 more seconds because of the late opening of the channel. It was at least 30 seconds late, but all right. It brings out my yeki portion. All right, well, we have a nice symmetrical group here to start with. <clears throat> Oh, more people are coming. All right, another 30 seconds. Let's make a l'chaim to Hanukkah. Oh, wowee. All right, well. Baruch Hashem. Oh, it's getting, look at this. Okay, if more people could put on their cameras. Come on. Oh, very nice. Much appreciated. We have Dina and Jill live. Yes. And more people are appearing. Okay, that's good. We like to get that right number of people. Come on, put on your phones, people. All right, no more, let's start. So we're going to begin with some historical background for the holiday of Hanukkah, okay? And this will help us appreciate what we're going to be learning today. Here we go. The story of Hanukkah takes place, begins in 165 before the Common Era. So that's about almost 2,200 years ago, okay? During the time of the second base of Migdash. It seems like yesterday, but it was almost 2,200 years ago. Wow. Okay, here's a little story update. So Yehuda HaMakabe led the military campaign of the Hashmanayim against the Greek Syrian army of Antiochus. So Antiochus, he was the bad guy. It's a shame we don't have um, the shirs with us tonight, right now because I'm going to quote, Shoshana told me that their four-year-old daughter, Hindi said, because there's a family of entertainers, so they start entertaining young in that family. She said, Auntie Esther was very, very good and Antiochus was very, very bad. Okay, that was it. <laughs> I laugh at my own jokes. Okay, especially jokes that four-year-olds tell, historical. Okay, Antiochus, he was the leader of the Greek Syrians. So, so Yehuda Hamakabe, inspired by his father, Matasyahu, who actually passed away before the Hanukkah miracle happened, had five, there were five sons, Yehuda, Shimon, Yochanan, Elazar, and Yonason. Actually, the, the war, some of the war happened right near us because right, not too far from us and between here and Yerushalayim is the community of Elazar, named after Elazar Hamakabi, who was actually killed by a Greek Syrian elephant just around the location of where their Yeshua, where their community is, Elazar. Now there's more historical, exciting information. Okay, so five sons led this military fight. It lasted for years. There were ultimately a few thousand Jews against 60,000 Greek troops. As we, we, allude, we speak about the story when we say al Hanisim. So when Yehuda Hamakabi realized that the Syrian Greek army was retreating from Yerushalayim. He retook Yerushalayim. He cleansed the Temple Mount, the Harabias, and the base of Migdash itself of all Greek gods, all altars to Zeus, all impurities the Greeks had introduced. The, the Greeks sacrificed pigs to their gods. Might have been appropriate. All right, that's just my personal comment. And most Jews were Hellenized. Some wanted to be and some were forced. And that's a very interesting fact. Most of the Jews were assimilated already. The Greek culture was so strong. They just had kind of fried out and were Hellenized means they were trying to live, trying to pass as Greeks. So there was a minority of Jews against the majority of Jews. It wasn't just against the Greeks. It was also a war against the majority of Jews who held with the Greeks. They were Hellenized. So the Rebbe points out in the prayer Al-Hanisim, we say Al-Hanisim when we 
when we daven, the Shemon Esrei, and we also say it in the, in the blessings after eating bread. <clears throat> if you happen to have a bencher or a sitter handy and you want to look on, I'm going to explain a little part of Al Hanisim now, if you're the kind of person who likes to look inside. Okay. So we say, Masarta Giborim Biyad Chaloshim. Hashem delivered the strong into the hands of the weak. Rabim biyad ma'atim, the, the, the many into the hands of the few. Utmeim biyad hataharim, the impure into the hands of the pure. Rashoim biyad sadikim, the evil ones into the hands of the righteous. Zaydim biyad oske sorosech, and the rebels into the hands of those who are occupied in your Torah. So there's five categories there that we mention: the strong into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the, the evil ones into the hands of the righteous, and the rebels into the hands of those who are occupied in your Torah. Hashem, we thank Hashem for delivering us. So the first two categories represent something miraculous, the strong into the hands of the weak and the many into the hands of the few, because usually the majority wins. The last three, however, the impure into the hands of the pure, the evil into the hands of the righteous, the rebels into the hands of those who learn, this is not necessarily a miracle. In the first two of the five, although in natural circumstances, they would be defeated, they triumphed. It's true that the, the impure were defeated by the pure, but that's not the miracle. The miracle is the strong into the hands of the weak. Now the first two refer to the Jews against the Greeks, and the last three are referring, against, referring to the Jews against the Hellenized Jews. Interesting, eh? So the majority of Jews were Hellenists. They're the Tameim, the Zaydim, and the Rishoyim. Now we know when the enemy is from your own people, it's much more difficult. When you're, own, when you're within your own family and community, there are people that are helping your enemy. It's much more difficult. I mean, this is one of the things also that when we were living under communism in Russia, it was the Alter Rebbe, the other, the, the, the Friedrich Rebbe, who suffered really from the most from, from Jews that had become communists. So when the enemy is from your own people, it's a much more difficult situation. So now the, mir now the miracle is much greater. So the last three are also a miracle because we're talking about Jews. So today in Israel, some of the greatest critics and enemies are Jews, Israelis, and it's a difficult challenge because we're right, we're all living here together within our own ranks and it creates a demoralization. I mean, that's what's one of the things happening in the army. It's one of the strongest armies in the world, but it's very hard for them not to be demoralized by all the limitations the government puts on them. They're not allowed to shoot unless somebody is, has a gun aimed at them. I mean, it's, it's very demoralizing for the army. From within, there's a voice that opposes the efforts. Okay, so the Hashmanayim stood up to the Hellenized Jews. The greatest accomplice of Antiochus was the Kohen Gadol at the time, Menelaus. Menelaus who succeeded Jason, who succeeded his brother Hunya. Jason was already a servant of Antiochus but he was considered to still be an Orthodox Jew. Menelaus carried out Antiochus's wishes. He wasn't even a Kohen, although he was appointed Kohen Gadol. And his mission was to Hellenize Judea, Yehuda, and all the Jewish people. So these are the last three categories we mention in Al when we say Al Hanisim. So Yehuda Hamakabi cleanse the Beis HaMikdash and Yerushalayim of all these tumas, of all these spiritual impurities. And then they went into the Beis HaMikdash 
And, and it was really a miracle. This was a guerrilla army fighting in the mountains and they managed to liberate Yerushalayim. So the Syrian Greek garrison in Yerushalayim withdrew, but the Maccabees didn't like win over the whole Syrian Greek empire. In, so Hanukkah 165 BC, they were able to go into the base of Migdash and cleanse it and light the menorah. And we know the story that one jug of oil remained pure and it had oil for one night and it burned for eight nights. We know the story. The Gomorrah Gamor Shabbos on page 21, side B, speaks about it. The Maccabees knew that the battle would continue. The Syrian Greeks weren't defeated yet. I mean, it went on for years after the Hanukkah story, after the Hanukkah miracle. The fact that they received, that we received this grace from heaven, that the menorah burned for eight days, ignited the Jewish people morally and spiritually. Because miracles, when we see miracles, we do get very enthusiastic, right? It's very exciting. You know, when our dear friends, Yitzhak and Sophia Kogan got out of, of communist Russia where they had been leading the underground in Leningrad for many years and they came to see the Rebbe and, um, and they, had to, they had Yechidas for two and a half hours. And of course, when they came out, everyone wanted to know what did the Rebbe say? What did the Rebbe say? And since they had just come out of communist Russia, she, first she said the worst thing is to say too much, but we did get one piece of information that the Rebbe said to them, they can't depend on miracles anymore. They have to do things naturally now. If they need a helicopter to fly to Odessa to do a bris, they'll have to order one. They can't just expect one to land on their roof. So, so they were very holy people and, and that living under tremendous pressure and danger and Hashem made miracles for them. But the Rebbe told them now that they're out of Russia, they can't depend on it. So you can get into the habit of depending on miracles. So he told them they couldn't depend on it. But when we see miracles and everyone has seen on some level, when we see miracles in our life, we're ignited, right? Morally, spiritually. So the Gemara says, the Shana Haba Kivu, the next year, the sages of the generation established it as an eight day holiday. So the question is asked, why did they wait till the next year? Why not that year? So we're going to look at an answer from Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev and his Sefer Kedushas Levi. Here's how, here's how he answers that question. Why did they, the sages wait for the next year to make it into a holiday. Here we go. So, so the miracle happened through Hashem, okay, and through the Kohanim who were from Shevet Levi. They said, Mila Hashem Alai, all who were to Shem, who are on Hashem's side come to us. And they got their name Maccabees from Mi Kamocha Be'elim Hashem. We, we say this, we say this is part of Az Yasha when we cross the Red Sea, we said, who is like you among the gods, Hashem. So the initials are Mem, Kaf, Beis, Yud, Maccabee. So the Hela Kedushas Levi writes, now this is an important part, a holiday in Torah is not just a commemoration or a, remember, a remembrance of an event from the past. A Yontuf in Yiddishkeit is, Hashem establishes that the same energy that flowed into the universe the first time around, the same energy comes around every year. So for example, we say it in Megillus Esther, these days of Purim will be remembered and practiced. Niskarim is remembered and Vanasim is practiced. The Holy Arizal says on that, by remembering them, Naasim, we, we establish, we it brings down the same spiritual energy flows and exists again. I mean, that's a very important idea. I think if we're not familiar with that, that idea that, that it's not just a commemoration and a remembrance, it's experiencing the same energy that was originally experienced on that day. I think that's very exciting to have in mind. Okay, so, Biblical holidays, Hashem established so, so that 
So we trust there is access to that spiritual energy on that day. Hanukkah and Purim are rabbinic holidays. So when the first Hanukkah finished, they couldn't make it a holiday, the Kedushas Levi says. They couldn't be sure that the next year on the 25th of Kislev, the same energy will flow. Otherwise, it would be a simple commemoration, which is not what a Jewish holiday is. So when the next year came around and they sensed the energy, that's when they made it a yontif. That's when they made it a holiday. Shana haba kavu. This is what the, ne the next year they established it. This is what the Bardich of the Rebbe says. Interesting, yes, that means like for us, we're already here in Eretz Yisrael, it's, it's flowing, that light, that miraculous light is already flowing, but it's not miss a moment of it. Now the war continued, the war continued after the Hanukkah story, there were actually four major military campaigns. Most of the brothers were killed, the war went on for many years, back and forth. So the vision of the sages, when they're when they, the, the Gomorrah says, Ma'ai Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? Here's what the Gomorrah answers. When the Hashmanayim won the war and retook, this is a quote, and retook the base of Migdash and cleansed it, they couldn't find oil. They found one jug with pure oil enough for one day, and it burned for eight days, and they made the holiday. You know, by the way, I learned many years ago from Rabbi Mengel in Beis Rivka that it was the finding the oil itself was a huge miracle because one of the people searching just started digging into the ground in the Beis Migdash and he found it and there was no tradition it was going to be buried. He just had the, the thought arose in his mind. It was a miracle that the thought arose in his mind to dig here for oil and he found this last this last little jug of pure oil. Okay, so in the Gomorrah, the victory of war is mentioned in passing as a prelude to the miracle of the oil. And we know the main mitzvah of Hanukkah is lighting the menorah. Although we mention the victory of the war in Al Hanisim, the, primarily, the primary commemoration is the miracle of the oil. Okay. So let's look at this historically. If you were making a holiday, okay, let's give a contemporary example. May, 1967. Let's go back there for those who are already born. Seven are Arab armies preparing war to annihilate Israel. There's 3 million Jews living in Israel at the time. This was only 20 years after Auschwitz, after the Shoah. The country is filled with survivors. They, we knew six million Jews were killed in Europe. Levi Eshkol, who was the prime minister at the time, he breaks down weeping in the middle of a speech just before the war broke out. They, fields were consecrated as cemeteries because they felt that they were gonna need them. And the war begins. And in six days, the war ends and Israel is four times the size. And even the Goyim said, even non-Jews said, this is a victory of biblical proportion. So what Israel did with that victory will remain a travesty for generations. I mean, the, the Rebbe was weeping a week after the war and so they're already planning to give it away. But the victory was unprecedented. It was a miracle. So the, the Jewish, Jewish life in, in Israel was saved and we, we, had, we got Yerushalayim and Hebron and Yesha and the Golan. This was the Nochama Sheish the Six Day War. So imagine, okay? Somebody went to the newly liberated Kosel, the Kotel, the wall, and lit a menorah with oil and it burned for a week. That would be a nice touch. But when we describe the major event, it was the military victory. It saved the Jewish people from annihilation. It was a miracle. Without the victory, there would be no Israel. There would be no 3 million Jews. So it was a tremendous thing. Even without a miracle of oil burning, it was like, okay, wow, what a miracle. Okay, 
So let's go to Hanukkah. If the Syrian Greeks, God forbid, had been successful, there would be no trace of Yiddishkeit or the Jewish people within 10, 20 years, nothing. There'd have been no trace of the Jewish people if they had been victorious. And as a side, as a footnote, there would there be, there wouldn't be, this was 165 BC. This was before the dawn of Christianity and Islam. They wouldn't have existed. There wouldn't have been Yiddishkeit. There wouldn't have been a sense of a personal God who has a personal relationship with all of us and loves us. That concept would not exist in the world. Okay, so Hashem saves the Torah and the Jewish people and the, they, they won the war. It was a military victory against, against impossible odds. And the, it was like a, a, few, a few Jews against 60,000 Greeks, well-trained Greek soldiers. So Torah and Mitzvah survived. The Jewish people survived as Jews and not as Greeks, yay. They come to the base of Migdash. They find only impure oil. They find one little jug of pure oil. They put it in the menorah. They expected it to burn for one night and it burns for eight days. What would have happened if they put in the oil and it burnt up that night? I mean, they would have had to wait seven more days to get new oil. But the story of Hanukkah, there's the victory, the survival, and yet the Gomorrah only mentions that in passing. The sages only mention it in passing. When they won the war, they found the oil, it burned for eight days, and the mitzvah of Hanukkah is based on that. So let's figure out what's happening here. One year later, they grasped a truth that we can only appreciate today, almost 2,200 years later, because the sages always had their eyes fixed on eternity, on the future. The military victory of the Hashmanayim didn't last. It was temporary. Soon the Syrian Greeks recaptured Jerusalem. It was back and forth. Yehud HaMakabe made a, made a pact with Rome, which the rabbis were opposed to at that time because Rome was an emerging superpower. The Syrian Greeks were afraid of Rome. Rome agreed to defend the Jewish people against the next Syrian Greek attack. And guess what? Rome never fulfilled its promise. The reason the rabbis were so upset was that you invite a lion into your house to protect you from a bear. The bear runs away when it sees the lion, but how do you get rid of the lion? That was Rome that you've invited into your house. And this planted the seed for Rome to destroy Judea years later, the destruction of the second day Samigdash. So the Hashmanayim ruled for a hundred years. And then there was conflict, there was civil war, but for a hundred years, there was some level of Jewish independence in the land of Israel. But it was a very difficult time. There was a lot of bloodshed. So the military victory was short-lived. A hundred years later, Rome came and took over. So this is the, listen to this part. The rabbis knew if we celebrate Hanukkah about a political military victory, a few years later, it's over. When the rabbis saw the nest of the menorah burning for eight days, that Hashem graced, that Hashem gave us this miracle, that the military victory of the Hashemnaim gave rise to another form of light. It, reignite, it reignited the light of faith and Torah. It was just so exciting. And we have this energy now, this energy of this miracle. So everyone prepared to get reignited. Could a few more people put on their cameras? I'd like to just see a few more people getting reignited. Come on, put on your cameras. Don't, that's the attitude. Come on, come on, don't be shy. All right, that's it. I'm continuing. So, so Hashem made the miracle with the oil. And this demonstrates the, internal, the eternal significance of the war. They liberated the base of Migdash and they brought back Kedusha to Am Yisro. So this is Hanukkah. So this is Hanukkah 
And the idea is that it's something that they saw for the future. This is something for the future, the new generation. That's something that could be always celebrated in the future, this miracle. Okay. So Chazal never made the mistake of just celebrating the moment. They always looked for the future. If Hanukkah was only a military um, victory, it's great for the moment. But what would we have later? Because we know there are Jews who celebrated Hanukkah under really terrible, terrible conditions, you know, in Auschwitz, in the war, in communist Russia. And the light of Hanukkah would brighten, them, brighten up their lives because it was much more than a military victory. If it was a military victory, they weren't able to see that then. But the miracle of the oil they could re-experience. I mean, these people were under the mercy of tyrants. It wasn't a military victory, but we could still be reignited with the light of Hanukkah. Isn't that so cool? That's why that's the emphasis is lighting the candles. Okay. So we see in Hanukkah testimony to the courage of the human spirit, the Jewish spirit, the courage to revive a nation. It was unbelievable, those Maccabees and Modine, the courage to revive a nation, like, wow, very cool. To bring Hashem's grace to the point of miracles. And they said, this is Hanukkah. My Hanukkah, this is Hanukkah. The Hashem graced us with this miracle of the oil. So in dark cellars, thousands of years later, when we didn't have any military power, Hanukkah comes and we can light a candle and feel free. This is what the sages, this is the bracha that the sages wanted to give us 2000 years later that we can light a candle and feel free. So after lighting the candles, okay, so now, you, now if you wanna follow inside, you need a sitter. We say Haneros Halalu. We've already said it, those people li listening in the rest of the world, can still say it tonight, and we're going to say it every night. Hanei So if you want to take a quick look inside. So I'm going to give a little background. It comes from, from the Gomorrah. And there are different versions and different sedorim. There's the version of the Shalah, of Yaakov Emden, of the Alter Rebbe. So we're going to look at the Alter Rebbe's version, which we see in our Siddur. So it says, Hanei halalu anu madli kim. Al hachuos, the al hanisim, the al haniflaos. So we thank Hashem for the salvations, that's the chuos, for the nisim, that's the miracle, for the niflaos, that's the wonders that you did for our forefathers. And at the end, so that's the beginning of Haneros, hallelujah. We thank Hashem for the chuos, the nisim, and the niflaos. And at the end, we say, today lahodos lahalel the shimcha hagadol al nisecha the al niflosecha the al yeshuasecha. In order to thank and praise Hashem, Hashem's great name, for the, for his mir his nisim for his nisecha is for his for your nisim niflosecha is for your wonders yeshuasecha is for your salvations. So there's a change of order at the end. The beginning has chuos, nisim, and niflaos. The end has nisecha, niflosecha, the Yeshua secha. So I know everyone's been wondering about that for a long time. And now I'm going to satisfy your curiosity. So this is very exciting. Get ready. Okay. So change of order. The new sack of davening. Is very precise. Let's just make a lachaim here, lachaim. The new sack of davening is very precise, including the order of words, especially in one prayer, one tefillah. So you take the same three, th three terms in the beginning at the end, but they're in a different order. So we're going to see the meticulousness, the meticulousness of the Alter Rebbe who chose this Nusach with this order. Okay, so what's the difference between Chuos, Nisim, and Niflaos? What's the difference between Chuos, Salvations, Nisim, Miracles, and Niflaos, Wonders? 
I will now explain. So a Yeshua represents a situation in which your, set, your success can be seen as a natural one and can be attributed 100% to natural causes. Nature can go either way, so, but you, so we need Hashem to help us. Here's an example. You need a job. People give in their resume. If I get accepted, it's not a miracle. Let's say there's just two resumes and I get accepted. It's not a miracle. It's perfectly natural. I have experience. I have a degree. But so does the other person. So I need Hashem's Yeshua. So if there's two people of equal strength, they're wrestling. Sometimes this one wins, sometimes that one wins. It's not a miracle, but we need Hashem's Yeshua. We need Hashem to help us so that we should be the one who gets the job. Okay, so that's Yeshua. We need Hashem's help and Hashem gives us the help, but it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle that we got the job, right? Okay, then Nisim. A Ness defies nature. It doesn't make sense according to nature. It's above nature. So, you know, like a, 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 a tiny, a, a few Jews fighting an enormous Greek well-armed army with elephants, it's a miracle. Giborim biyad chalashim, the strong into the hands of the weak. That's a Ness. It's not something natural. It's a miracle. Okay. So a Yeshua would be a person has a cold. The body has the ability to recover, to get better. We won't say it's a nest, but something could go wrong. We need Hashem's help. That's Yeshua. It's not to find, to find you know, it's not going above nature. People get over colds, but that we should get over, that it shouldn't get worse. That's the Yeshua. Well, a nest is something that's above nature, that defies nature. So what about the Niflaos? So wonders means you could, you could explain it naturally, but it would be a, a very, very strange coincidence. Unbelievable hashgacha pratis. Example, 20,000 people give in their resumes and I get chosen. It's not a ness, it doesn't defy nature, but it's a pella, it's a wonder that it happened to me. So let's say, let's say you're trying to find an old friend. You're looking everywhere for the person. You're looking at all social media. You can't track them down. Then you go into a gas station and there they are. You meet the person. So it's not a miracle. It's not against nature, but it's a very strange coincidence. It's unbelievable, unbelievable hashgacha pratis. So those are the niflaos. So in life, something amazing happened to me. It's not that it couldn't happen, Al Piteva, but it happened. It's a Pella, okay? So sometimes there are, there are things in nature that are unique, that attest to something higher, but we can't say it's a miracle that defies nature. Okay, so now that we've defined our three terms. So the Hanukkah story, how did it begin? It was triggered by, we know the story, the Greeks demanded that in every village and in Yerushalayim, there should be erected altars to Greek gods and Jews should sacrifice animals, especially pigs, to Greek gods. So in Modin, the Greeks told the Jews, build an altar and sacrifice a pig to our gods. And there was a Hellenized Jew that said, okay, and he was about to do it. So Matis Yahu called his five sons and they killed this Hellenist and who was helping the Greeks and the few Greek soldiers who were there. So this was a Yeshua, five strong Jews against a Jew and Greek soldiers, a few Greek soldiers. It's Yeshua, so they didn't need a nest to defeat them. But there was a fight, so they needed Yeshua's Hashem. They needed Hashem's salvation, that they should come out. And Hashem helped them, and they won. Okay, so even to drive home the idea you need Yeshua's Hashem, there are no guarantees. Nature allows us to get home, but other things can happen. Everyone should get home 
in peace. In other words, anytime we're driving home, it's a Yeshua. We need Hashem's Yeshua that we should get home safely. It's not a miracle, but it's a Yeshua. Okay, so that's the Yeshua. So part two, the Nisi. Once this happened, it triggered a war. Antiochus sent the 60,000 Greek troops against a family of Hashmanayim, and they fought them and won. Nisim, the Greeks withdrew. Aness, it's like a sheep who's surrounded by 70 wolves, and the 70 wolves wind up all bleeding and running away, and the sheep won. It's a miracle. It's a ness. Okay, part three. They retake the base Hamigdash. They go in. All the oil is tummy, is impure. They can't use it. And then they find one jar of oil still sealed with the seal of the Kohen Gadol. This is the pe Pella, this is Niflaos. It doesn't defy nature that the Greeks missed one jug and they couldn't defile it, but it's a Pella that it was found, as we said, that, some, that the thought entered someone's mind to dig, it was found, it was pure. It's a Pella, it doesn't defy nature, but it's wondrous Hashgacha practice. Then afterwards, we have that other major ness. The oil burnt for eight days. Haneris halalu anu madlikin. Why? Okay. So in the beginning of Haneris halalu, we speak about al hachuos. That's the first event in Modin. Then we say al hanisim. That's the war against the Greeks. Then we say al haniflaos. That's finding the jug of oil. So, so in the beginning, when we were talking about the reason we light the candles, we, we mentioned them chronologically. This is the story of Hanukkah. Again, the Chuos are that first event in Modim, the Nisim is winning the war, the Niflaos is finding the jug of oil. Okay, that's the beginning. So the beginning of Haneris Halalu is chronological order. And then we come to the end of Haneris Halalu. We light this light to thank Hashem, and now the order changes. We say, Al Nisecha, the Al Niflo Secha, the Al Yeshua Secha. Okay, why this order? So, Nisecha, your miracles, that evokes the most gratitude. It's above nature. Hashem made miracles for us above nature. Then we thank you for the Niflo Secha, for the wonders. And then the Yeshua Secha. So we do it, whatever um, of the most gratitude is for the miracles, then for the nif, then for the wonders, and then for the Yeshuos. So we come to realize that even Yeshuos, natural things, we didn't need a miracle. Still, we have to be thankful. We actually drove home safely. Wow, yes, we have to be, it's not a miracle, but we have to be thankful for the Yeshuos. Because even here, Hashem intervenes that we should be able to get home safely. So the order chronologically is Chuos, Nisim, and Niflaos. And then the order of gratitude is Nisim, Niflaos, and Yeshuos. Okay, wow. Very cool. Okay, so here we are. Here we are celebrating the unique miracle of Hanukkah. And I have five more minutes left, not to squander. So um, one of the things I like most about the story of Hanukkah, it's, you know, it asks, was the miracle of the oil like the miracle of, of, of Sara, 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 Sari Menu, that was the quality of the oil. She lit candles and something about the quality of the oil that it lasted all week, one question. Or was it like the, um, the widow on the story with Alicia that she just, it was the quantity, she just kept on pouring and pouring and pouring because the miracle was in the quantity. So you can ask, was the miracle of Hanukkah like either of these? And the Rebbe answers, no, it was a unique miracle. It was something like, because it couldn't be, he explained, the Rebbe explains why it couldn't be that it was in the quality of the oil, that the oil just burned slowly down like Sarah's, because it had to be up to a certain line in the menorah every night to satisfy the halacha. So it had to be that it was, okay, we're gonna to get to the right answer. Why couldn't it be like the miracle of the widow with Alicia? Because that was, that was, that was oil from heaven. And halachically you have to use oil from olive trees 
on Hanukkah. You can't use oil from heaven. So what was the miracle the Rebbe teaches us? It was something like quantum mechanics where two different things are happening simultaneously, like light is two opposites. It's, it's a wave and a particle. So the miracle of Hanukkah was that the light was burning and not burning simultaneously each moment, something that transcends logic. So that means every moment of Hanukkah is a miracle. Because like today is the first day, you could say, well, there was enough oil for the first day. Maybe it's not a miracle today, but it is because each moment it was burning and not burning. And we have to live our lives by seeing the constant miracles. You know, there's people who could say, you know, 30 years ago, I once had a miracle. I've kind of forgotten about it. Or 30 years ago, I had a miracle and I kind of remember it. But it's more like every minute is a miracle. So I want to bless everyone. I want to bless everyone that we should be blessed to experience the miracle of Hanukkah, each moment of Hanukkah, and each moment of our lives. L'chaim. So I wouldn't mind taking a get well Hanukkah picture for the Rav if a few more people want to put on their cameras to be included here. Let's go. Come on, let's see you put it. I want to see your faces, all my friends all over the world. But don't be shy. Okay, yes. Okay, one, two, three. Yes. So next week is going to be Hanukkah vacation. Enjoy. So Merit Hashem will be back in two weeks. Thank you all for coming. It was wonderful seeing everybody and getting a chance to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah, Freilach and Hanukkah. Much love. Shalom, shalom. Bye, bye, bye. Really love you all. Thank you.